When you dare to share, you break the silence. When you dare to share, you speak your truth. When you dare to share, you use the full strength of your voice. When you dare to share, it brings opportunity to own your story. So tell it, be heard, and at the same time, your sharing is someone else's learning, inspiration, motivation, empowerment, and hope. There's always an element to each of our stories that remains a secret. For some, we feel it's a dirty little secret. Dare to Share Your Untold Story exposes these secrets in a welcoming and positive way. I encourage each of you out there to dare yourself to share what is yours to tell. When we dare, it is the courage to do something really important. Let this be a vow to each and every single one of us that we take risk, we brave, confront, and face what is, while inspiring and empowering all communities. So let's break that silence and tap into mental beauty. This is Salima Jadavji, your podcast host, a practicing clinical social worker, and your mental wellness connoisseur. Welcome to the Dare to Share Your Untold Story podcast, episode number 25, The Dis-Ease of Trauma, Murder, and Death. To all my fellow listeners, Before we get started, I'm just dropping in a note to give you a heads up that this podcast might be emotionally triggering for you. We do invite guests onto the show who share openly about extremely difficult life moments with exposure and impact of what the struggles have been like. The intensity of each episode could have a variable impact on your emotional and mental well-being based on your own personal story. If at any point the topic becomes uncomfortable or upsetting to you in any way, please do not pressure yourself to listen. Instead, be kind to yourself, do some self-care, and perhaps give another episode a try. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing our truly daring guest, Karis Craig. Karis's first book, titled Dead Reckoning, How I Came to Meet the Man Who Murdered My Father tells the story of her correspondence and meeting with the incarcerated man who murdered her father when she was 11 years old. It was a Globe and Mail Best 100 Book of 2017, finalist for the 2018 Hubert Evans BC Book Prize, and finalist for the 2018 Governor General's Literary Award. Karis is faculty and coordinator in the Child and Youth Care Degree Program at Douglas College in Metro Vancouver, BC, and she is currently completing her Doctor of Education in Educational Leadership. She lives with her son and loves to check out the rivers surrounding Port Coquitlam. She can often be found brainstorming her next home design project, binge-watching crime TV, or waiting for the pandemic to end so she can go sit at coffee shops to read and write for much too long periods of time. Hi, Karis. Welcome to the Dare to Share Your Untold Story podcast. Hi, Salima. It's so nice to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Wonderful. Karis, I'm just super excited to have you on the show and, you know, for just being here and showing up. Super, super thankful that you bring willingness to share. And I also appreciate the support um, that you're lending here for taking a stance to help break barriers of mental stigma. Thank you. Oh, you are so welcome. I love even just the title of your podcast this idea of daring and being Mm -hmm. bold and Mm -hmm. just everything. I'm just, I just love it. I love the energy of it all. Oh, thank you. Yeah. It's really all emphasizing bringing forward untold stories, right? People's untold stories. And whether it's about mental health or a struggle of another kind, what we know is that the mental health component always gets tucked away. People are shy to share about what is the inner workings of their mental health impact, right? Yes. And I think right now is such an amazing time to be talking about mental health and expanding what we mean by that and just breaking down and deconstructing everything about it. Um, I think uh, how we're moving all into the future is so, um, is so good. I like how you 
use the words breaking down and deconstructing because that's exactly what it is. And that is the whole point uh, or the whole premise of creating this, this podcast, really to break the barriers of mental stigma. You're right. We are in a period of time where we have an opening to be able to, you know, peel away a few more layers um, and educate people and really allow opportunity for conversation to get that dialogue going. I hope that with our conversation today that we can also encourage other people to come forward, to get a little comfortably uncomfortable, to share and and tell what typically people shy away from expressing. And I'm also bringing forward a trend. It's called the mental beauty rethink. So what comes to mind? (laughs) Yeah, tell me what comes to mind when you hear the words mental beauty, what strikes for you? I love this term mental beauty. I have not seen it in that kind of phrasing or positioning uh, Mm -hmm. before. And so I love, I just love it. I love it. What (laughs) makes me think about, it makes me think about growth and opportunity and Mm -hmm. like changing lives ourselves and others and expanding Mm -hmm. what we mean by how we live in the world. Right. Mm -hmm. I think for way too long, based on so many different contexts and reasons and Mm -hmm. as so much historical ghosts in kind of what we currently think of Mm -hmm. mental health. I think the idea of mental health brings us like looking to the future and saying, Mm -hmm. okay, like how can we live our lives with mental beauty and how can we support that or, or change our environments to support that and, and speak to each other in that manner, as opposed to perhaps the more pathological, um, uh, uh, weight that uh, sometimes the the words mental health bring. That's exactly, um, you know, you said it so well. That is exactly the the thought process behind it, right? And part of the deconstruction is to look at it from a lens of something that's accepting, right? Mental beauty. Mm-hmm. So you and I are in the right place. <laughs> We're definitely in the right place, and I can't get. I I really can't wait to get started. Um, with our conversation. How about you? Let's do this. So Karis, give us the newspaper headline of how you would title your untold story. I met my father's murderer and then set myself free. Mm. I met my father's murderer and then set myself free. I know that you've written a book and it is about this very topic. Can you expand a little bit about how you, how you came to, um, create this particular headline for yourself? Ooh, this particular headline? Mm-hmm. Well, I think it encapsulates everything. I think it starts, I think it includes the fact that, you know, uh, when I was younger, my father was murdered. Eventually I met my father's murder and then set myself free. And in there implies journey, implies struggle, implies all these horrific um, events that occurred and so I'm sure you're going to ask me about those mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, but um, but yeah so it just in, uh, captures everything uh, but most importantly um, setting ourselves free I mean uh, so many people listening uh, to your podcast so many people in the world have experienced various uh, traumas and um, perhaps they too are survivors of crime um, and uh, there's nothing more, um, it feels like your control or uh, live, livelihood or your, um, your freedom is taken away, uh, mm-hmm. I feel, upon, mm-hmm. uh, upon experiencing crime. And I, um, I didn't know that that was the journey I was pursuing, but it ended up being that way to set myself free. Right. So much to unpack with those three words, set myself free, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Uh, That's really beautiful, uh, the way you've been able to articulate that. So then tell us, what is your untold story all about? When I was 11 years old, I was living in Calgary. Um, and my, uh, we moved to Calgary from Vancouver uh, for my dad to study to become an orthopedic surgeon. And we were hanging out, living in community and uh, having a very um, uh, lovely life. Uh, and uh, one uh, night, in the middle of the night, at about four o'clock in the morning, a young man who was high on a number of substances 
um, was wandering around the community looking to break into uh, different um, garages to steal cars. And when he was in our family's garage trying to steal my father's car, he saw the window open slightly open in my home Mm -hmm. and uh, he then proceeded to break into my house and Mm -hmm. wander around looking for something to steal and uh, picked up a knife in the kitchen and went toward the noise instead of running away Mm -hmm. Uh, that noise was my father waking up and uh, coming down to be uh, startled by by this man this young man and uh, when that was uh, when he was uh, stabbed a number of times mm-hmm. and that man ran away uh, to be found a few days later. Uh, but my father lay there um, bleeding and struggling and uh, uh, which is when I heard, woke up and heard my mo- mother yelling, call 911. And so I did. And while the rest of my family was um, surrounding my father, as the neighborhood also came to surround him, uh, I was on the phone with the operator, emergency responder. Um, My father then uh, was uh, taken to the hospital, in fact, where he was training and Mm -hmm. was um, surrounded by the nurses and doctors and and people um, who he'd worked with for a number of years. And um, he died uh, from massive blood loss. That, of course, uh, changed every single aspect of my world. And of course, I I know we'll go into those pieces. Yeah, right. Um, But... Uh, eventually after you know lots of healing work and lots of exploration and lots of anger and all all of the things that come along with um, being a survivor of crime and and the death of a massive force in your life that Mm -hmm. changes everything you know many 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 years later Mm -hmm. um I was uh with a friend uh at my work place and we were having coffee and she was a new friend and she uh, unlike every single other friend who had asked me about how my father died and I would tell them very similarly to what I've just told you now right. I'm much shorter <laughs> um, <laughs> okay and uh and they're they of course quite expectedly respond with just a dropped jaw um, and uh, understandably, uh, but she was different. She asked me, um, do you know anything about your father, uh, about the incarcerated man who murdered your father? And I basically didn't. I didn't know a lot. I knew kind of what an 11 year old knew. Yeah, and, you were just 11 uh, years so, old. So I exactly. mean, your big role that night was to call the police, right? Like you called exactly. 911 and, and there were so exactly. many other adults around, right? Exactly. And so that kind of invitation or that opening from this curious, lovely friend, uh, we the, I then started um, a journey of exploring who is this man. What a curious um, question, and um, yes. and I'm sure that you might were you a bit surprised? Like you said that you know most people their their jaws drop and then they don't know what to say after that. Yes. And and this person was really different. Like her her questioning or her curiosity led you to a different path. Um, yes. Did she stick around the whole time? Like while you guys did, you get curious together, or was that just something she asked and and left it? She was definitely this friend was definitely a part of the whole journey. Mm-hmm. I mean, she was an outsider to the journey. I would check in with her once in a while, but she really sparked it in a very unique way and um definitely was a part of it uh, she's actually plays a, a, a large part in the in the book itself my check-ins with her uh-huh. um and it, I was surprised but I was surprised in a really lovely way I'm always also surprised when people are shocked because um in fact, this is quite a normal thing that's happened to me. It's part of my history. It's part of my story of who I am. And I and now I can't imagine my life without it, right? Like I everything in my world makes its sense because of all the things that have happened to me, including this. And so when people respond in shock, I actually, I really don't like it. Like I, I don't judge them for that. I fully understand why, but I'm also like, well, that's what happened to me. Um, and because often the shock, right. yeah, often the shock comes with kind of like 
whoa, like I can't even fathom or how horrific. And, and it's like, well, well, my life isn't horrific. That was horrific. And I thank you. But and so when my friend offered this curiosity and, you know, just a no pressure question, it really opened up things for me. And it led to this massive journey of setting myself free. And, and then, of course, you know, the rest, I, I wrote a book about it. And, right. <laughs> and there you go. <laughs> I'm curious if it's okay for me to ask Karis, mm. if we can go back to 11 year old Karis, if it's okay, yeah. I guess I'm curious about like, if you can recall, like what was like the first, you know, body experience or thought experience or emotion experience that you had? Like, did you hear the sounds or was mm -hmm. your first sound that you heard your mom saying, Hey, call, call 911. Did you get to see your father? I'm just curious mm -hmm. about that process and what that was like for you for your like first moment of, wow, this, this has now changed my world. Yeah. So I remember what I believe to be quite a bit, but also not a lot. So I remember them, those moments and kind of just mini pictures or mini um, moments and feelings. So I remember waking up to screaming uh, mm -hmm. I and it was my I, I'm fairly certain it's my mom screaming I don't I didn't know this until my mom told me later but I think she was saying Karis call 911 but all I remember is call 911 I think I was the only one with the phone in their room mm -hmm. um, at that time my siblings are younger than me not much but younger and uh, I do I do remember leaving my room after that phone call I remember the phone call um, the operator made me stay on the phone and, and repeat my age, my what I thought my father's age was, because at 11, you don't really know their age. Right. Um, and uh, I remember that distinctly. Um, I remember going down the stairs, stairwell that was covered in blood. I remember the smell of the blood. Um, there was a lot of blood. Um, mm -hmm. I remember... I remember being escorted over to my neighbor's house who were long friends with. And um, I remember um, shaking in the bathroom while we were kind of all put in the rec room, like with sleeping covers and all that kind of stuff. And um, I remember shaking in this bathroom uh, thinking, what just happened to my world? I understood that my dad um had been injured I right. did not see him like my siblings saw him touched him interacted with him um I didn't I was up in the room and uh I um yeah I remember being next door and I remember it was only two hours between the time that they left and my mom came back mm -hmm. um with uh other neighbors and the police and I remember crime scene tape all over my outside the lawn I remember you know different details like that that's a lot that's a lot of stuff to remember and that you remember such vivid components right like tapping yeah. into your senses and having that sensational memory and so when you called 911 and your yeah your, and your if your mom when your mom said hey call 911 did you know yeah. what you were calling 911 for Yes, I knew. I do remember telling them my dad's hurt, my dad's bleeding. And so I must have seen him. I must have something, but I don't actually remember but that part. You don't part. remember that part. Yeah, I do remember telling mm. the operator, though, my dad's hurt. He's bleeding. Everyone's screaming, that kind of thing. Um, But, you know, I, I didn't witness his stabbing. I didn't mm -hmm. you were um, not hear sure. yeah. that right. other, the young man. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. That is... Yes. Um, that's a that, that's a lot of those are a lot of pieces that you have been able to keep in your memory. Have you ever have you ever tried to recall other memories or have you just made peace with this is part of what happened and I'm okay mm -hmm. recalling this and I'm okay not recalling other aspects? Well, I would say um this kind of fits into kind of my later life as well, but I um I wrote and so I knew, I knew, I don't recall writing before my dad died, but people tell me that I did, mm -hmm. um, like in journals, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. And uh, I remember writing a lot. And so um, I used to write like, you know, in my middle school years, um, poetry and uh, journal writing. And I remember if I look back, of which I have quite a bit of it um, to, today, uh, I see um, myself processing all of those memories in different mm -hmm. ways. Mm -hmm. And so uh, different details. And so I, I would say kind of indirectly, I wasn't 
purposely doing that. I was just being my 11 year old self. And so I'm um, just the, draw or gravitating towards writing as a way of processing, expressing all the things. But at the time, like no one told me that's a great way to process or express or remember things. Rather, I did it as a survival technique. I was like, I need to, I have this thing inside me that's trying to tell me something and I need to write. And so I did. That's really fascinating how you use that as, as a way to really have as a coping leg, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And didn't know it at the time. Right. Um, you know, there have been people who have supported that. Certainly I remember in grade nine. So a, a couple of years later, uh, there was a guidance counselor who probably saw me, right? Uh, and she gave me my first, like, official journal. And I still have that journal. It's, like, teeny tiny writing front to mm -hmm. back. And it's all just processing just so much intensity. And, you know, all the aftermath of that death and murder and crime. Um, because, of course, once, as, as my father died, it changed everything in my life. It changed the way we interacted. It changed the the wellness of our family, the ability to respond to each other's needs. Um, it, it took away the joy and, and fun. My dad was a very charismatic, very gregarious guy. And uh, it took that out, right? And so what happens when you take these different elements out and you know, we, there were a number of other losses that are all, you know, enmeshed into one, including moving back to Vancouver to be closer to my mom's family and which was a great um, privilege to be able to do. But also, you know, I lost my friends in elementary school. I lost my um, community that I knew. I lost, you know, so all of that is entangled into one. And so it was a pretty horrific time, even though I look back and, and, you know, on the outside, everyone thinks you're, 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 functioning just fine <laughs> mm -hmm. I think it's um such a big part of of how how you're well, I guess it's not me telling you that it's a big part of how you're <laughs> affected I guess I'm hearing mm -hmm. you say that there's a lot of different elements and and pieces to um how you were affected having gone through this journey of your father of the the breaking into the family home and your father being murdered mm -hmm. and, and or, mm -hmm. or your father being um attacked and stabbed and yes. and and then dying can i say something though yeah yes please <laughs> um just as you say that it's making me think um you know there were aspects of the loss that we dealt with i think fairly well you know if you're to separate the pieces like so for example his death like we we remember him we have rituals and celebrations about him we incorporate him into our lives in various different ways over the years um but I will say that never um throughout my whole kind of first kind of wave of healing journey if you want to call it that I guess that immediate survival type of time that decade I would say or more that um that we never ever ever spoke about the crime and mm. so um, the crime aspect, the trauma aspect. So it was very clear that like my father died and we kind of, there were things that we did to, you know, attend to his loss, um, right. the loss of his presence um, and, uh, and, and connection to him. But um, never was it spoken that we had experienced a trauma, right? Like there was the trauma of his loss, but no one ever acknowledged in any sort of meaningful or therapeutic or any pursuit that um we had witnessed murder or the immediate af aftermath of murder in our family home and so um and that there was this person who was entirely responsible for that and so we never spoke about him we never spoke about even mm -hmm. the criminal justice process you know i i was sent to a, like ha uh, almost a year later i was sent to camp for two weeks and i had no idea that there was a two-week murder trial happening in the community wow. like you know and so um and to, and to no offense to anybody because yeah. it's, it makes total sense to me mm -hmm. um but at the but i find that hugely problematic now looking back yeah <laughs> right yeah there's so many layers to mm -hmm. what what has unfolded from the act of one individual yeah and and you also talk about well first of all it's nice to hear that there are so many aspects of the loss that have been dealt with and that there are these celebrations and ways that you incorporate the remembering of your father into many aspects mm -hmm. of of how 
how your life is today include him as well i'm curious about i'm curious more about like um you know the family dynamics you know what did you notice change Mm -hmm. i i see that in terms of the crime and the trauma and those aspects in the criminal justice process that that Mm -hmm. not having a space at, at home has it started to have space now like in the more present time um and how does your family interact uh, at like did i guess did any relationships change yeah yeah well i'll say to one to one question is um mm-hmm. to one Sorry, of so many questions is that <laughs> <laughs> oh sure no no for sure there's so many threads oh my gosh so many right. and um i would say so like you know 20 years later and we can talk about that but like 20 years later i pursued that on purpose right like i was like i need to address the crime part um, of this loss. And I felt that the the 20 years building up to that, it was about surviving the loss part and the restabilizing your life part. Um, because it changed everything. It changed the way I interact, the, the way all of us interacted with each other in my immediate family. It turned us into just survive. You guys mm-hmm. just survive. And because we're um, uh, like a family that really... Um, prioritized education uh we were um relatively affluent we had a number of privileges in in life and 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 we went we went full throttle all kids my mom will say this we went full throttle perfection perfectionism and so um so uh you have to be okay you have to look okay you have to perform well you have to do all this kind of stuff and so um so so on the outside that looks like to people that are like oh great we don't have to worry about them (laughs) um but and I laugh and I laugh kind of um because it's like are you kidding me like (laughs) and so newspapers would report various people saying oh the kids look fine the kids you know they're fine Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, like what an interesting perspective, because of course, like at home we're surviving. My mom, God bless her. She was able to wake up every morning, get out of bed and get us, you know, integrated into our lives. Um, But if that were me, like I couldn't get out of bed. Like I, you know, I wouldn't, I I have no idea how she coped with that reality Mm -hmm. of four children Mm -hmm. um, and a murdered father. And so, you know, you know, just little things, just no more fun. There was no more fun. There was no more um, like joy. There was no more, you know, adventures, no matter how anyone tried, like my mom tried, Um, but everyone was just struggling. And, uh, and, and I think that we all fell back on a couple of crutches that were highly pro-social, like mm-hmm. um, doing well in school and uh, that type of thing. Uh, and yet for myself, um, there was just this deep, what I like to call existential depression. Like, what, what is this? What, what are we here for? What is life about? What is this for? Uh, yeah. And did you notice anything different about how you interacted with your siblings or how they interacted with you? Yeah, like I, um, so I was 11. And so I kind of probably have like five years of remembering of our family. And so we used to, you know, hang out all the time and, you know, fight and play and mm-hmm. <laughs> all yeah. those things. Um, right. And kind of afterwards, for a number of different reasons, we kind of just all isolated. They, they might say this differently, but in the house, like I, I experienced it as very isolated. So even mm-hmm. if, you know, we were watching, t- a couple of us were watching TV together. It was very isolating or, you know, not as many, um, you know, family dinners or uh, mm-hmm. like um, that type of isolation or just right. like, you know, just struggling in your own room and, you know, that mm-hmm. kind of thing. And so everyone felt really isolated. No one kind of went to each other for support. Not that they, anyone of us could have surpri- uh, provided that for each other, right. but very much like isolation because we were all, right. I believe, just in, in pure survival mode. Yeah. Just trying to get by. And feeling a lot of pressure to get by well. And so, um, yeah, like just not a lot of room to just be like, wow, this is really awful. This is horrific, in fact. And that it's, you know, perhaps it's okay if I self-destruct a little. It wasn't just about getting by. It was about getting by well and perfectly. Yeah. As perfect as you can. There's so many layers um, Mm -hmm. to, to the experience of trauma and... Um, you know, it seems like you've taken the leap to pursue um, the aspect that focused on the crime part, right? As you mentioned, 
did your yeah. family support you? Like, did you, when you first started to pursue, did you keep that mm-hmm. like to yourself just to learn a bit more? Or did you kind of mm-hmm. let them know what you were doing? And when they did learn what you were doing, like, how did they reply or, or how did they engage with you? This is a really good question because like the first part of your question, I would say that, you know, I've always been kind of hell bent on like, I'm going to figure this out. This is wrong. I'm feeling not okay. I'm going to go pursue whatever I need. And so I think in the first like 10 plus years, I was um, just trying to understand like what happened to me and like, what, what is this world about? And how can I stay connected to my dad, even though everyone wants me to say goodbye or separate or all, you know, those things move on all those horrible um, uh, metaphors in, in counseling training, as, as you might also (laughs) have learned, I have through my training too. Um, But I and then I, I see uh, now that I'm looking back, uh, I see you know 20 years later when I was 29 looking to pursue like who is this man? How can I be in contact with him? Uh, what might I want to ask or share with him? I see that as a natural progression of healing. Yes. And so um, you know I I'll, I'll go into that of course, but now I, I it's other things right? Like now I have a little little four an almost four year old mm-hmm. and the, the new like natural progression of healing though it's not as I don't feel like in a moment of survival anymore. I feel that there's new layers of healing and growth. And, uh, mm-hmm. and so like, it's like now my current challenge is like, how do I bring my dad, my little guy's grandpa into his life in a good way um, that mm-hmm. doesn't traumatize my child. Right. Mm-hmm. And then, and I'm fairly certain that when I get to my father's age in a couple of years, when he died, I can have other moments and, you know, in 10 years and 10 years and 10 years. So I have a, I have a strong sense that I'm going to continue that, but, but in, but in ways that really fit for me because when I was when I was almost 30 I had that conversation with my friend and um and I pursued knowing knowing this person and I um I knew that there was ways that I could like access him he was incarcerated he was still incarcerated and I pursued a restorative justice um, organization that I knew of through a, a series of experiences I had had um and uh and I had I pursued that for actually quite a while um uh, before I told my family um right. I told a couple of friends her okay. my friend mm-hmm. uh, plus maybe two other people and at the time for quite a while until I understood like oh this is what's happening here or I feel mm-hmm. safe I feel that I'm doing what I'm doing is good and I want to continue it and right. eventually I told them and I um, when I told them um it was kind of their response was kind of neutral like it was kind of like oh okay and um yeah and actually I write about that in the book uh, as it was quite a moment of like, Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm on this on my own and that's fine. And that's always the way it's been. And it's kind of the way I want it now. But, um, but, but I knew that by telling them they were involved somehow, they like, you know, like they, they were, you know, we're all linked together. Right. And by me, by contacting this man impacts them. Like it doesn't, you know, I don't know how it'll impact them, but it does. And Mm -hmm. so I wanted to make sure it was, something good uh yeah. before I told them and to continue on my own terms I didn't want anyone influencing it mm-hmm. you know when a person experiences trauma the way that you've been unfolding all of these different elements and pieces it just brings me to understand um that when you experience this kind of trauma any kind of trauma actually there are a lifetime of firsts yes Right. As you said, that this has changed my life. And though it's become part of my life, uh, Mm -hmm. there's different healing at different points in your journey. Yes. I'm curious. I'd like to ask or I'd like to before I ask, I guess what I want to say is as a therapist, when people come to see me for therapy, people are usually in one of three places. Mm -hmm. There's some who are getting started wanting to figure out where they need to focus um, to to get to where they need to go. Some are right Mm -hmm. in the midst of things and they need some support navigating. And there are some people who are looking back, maybe Mm -hmm. uh, working on getting closure or looking to take the leap into the next chapter, or Mm -hmm. they're just looking back as and and reflecting and introspecting and, you know, taking in the lessons and learning. Um, So for yourself, what part of the journey would you consider that you're in? 
So first off, I want to say I love the metaphors you've just used. So, okay. so I'm a writer. And so I know this <laughs> language very acutely. And so when you say kind of like the getting started in the midst, looking back and forward, um, I am, it brings me right to my book, because I wanted to talk I wanted to write about my journey, about this mm -hmm. kind of slice of time um, in that way, too, that it is a part mm -hmm. of a journey. Mm -hmm. um, so like just a quick note, the dead reckoning, I heard this. I heard this term that I that becomes the title of my book mm -hmm. and um I, I I I love it because I feel like it speaks so much to this idea of journeying through trauma and and through life and so dead reckoning means to attempt to figure out where you are and where you are going based on where you have been um and I use I use navigation um, terms within my book because my dad was a sailor and I was experimenting with sailing at the time. And, uh, and I love this kind of navigation and journeying um, because I think it just honors the fact that everyone's on a journey. And so I would say right now, I would say I'm very much looking back and looking forward. In fact, I would say now I'm looking forward um, to the point where um, I would say uh, that I have this lovely privilege now where I don't count the years since my dad died. I don't, I, a year or two ago, I forgot. I forgot that it was like 27 years since my dad died. And I thought, whoa, I love this feeling of not knowing that. Um, and, and so, but I would also say to your question is that I'm just getting started with this next phase. And so, um, and I feel maybe that I'm in the midst of navigating how do you talk to a four-year-old or a one-year-old or a seven-year-old or whatever about um, their grandpa, who's so important in their life, um, who's so important in my life, who um, created a world that they now enjoy um, and benefit and from and everything, that they were murdered. And so I am... Um, you know, I have a background in child and youth care and, mm -hmm. and counseling, etc. So mm -hmm. I, I have a like, I have a bit of a orientation to, you know, what might be the right words, um, or developmental questions they may be asking, and etc. But, and the ways to interpret their experience, but I feel like I'm just starting with this new time and, and just starting with um, also, like, um, a new part of my interpretation of the loss for, uh, for example, what I mentioned before, my dad died when he was 44. And uh, I am turning 40 in a couple of months. And um, I, so I'm also starting an educational journey at the same time when he went back to school. And I'm going to end around the time when he, um, when he died. And I, I anticipate this to be a massive moment of thinking, wow, like he didn't get to live the rest of his life. Um, my family uh, is, ha is very privileged in their good genetics that are like mm -hmm. long long life genetics mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I have a very strong feeling he would have lived very old my mother always says you know um uh, I always feared that he would have um died in a crash accident heli skiing because my dad was such a risk taker and mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. he was either going to die that way or he was going to die when he was like 85 95 years old and so I have this sense that I'm right now entering this moment of um wow like I get this great privilege of living my life in this beautiful community with watching my young son grow and what a great privilege to watch him grow and like I think I'm gonna have a lot of new um not not necessarily healing but a lot of new growth and opportunity for discovery and uh as as those things change as I age older than my dad's life and as I watch my son grow older than 11. It's so fascinating to hear about how you're navigating all of these pieces and and holding space for each one of them and I, and I'm also hearing you talk about markers right um that help yes. you identify and it seems like when you're talking about looking forward what I sensed was that your marker to identify knowing that you're looking forward is that you're not counting the years anymore. The anniversary yeah. is not like you're aware of the dates. Like you, you can yeah. acknowledge all of that. Like, you know, what, what is, what has occurred. Um, but you're not focusing on death anniversary dates and the number of years and how long ago was this or any particular, the specifics. And yes. I think yes, that is such a big marker of looking forward. What do you think your marker of looking back was? You know what? Writing the book, about my interaction with the incarcerated murderer um, 
was so generative creatively. Mm-hmm. It may, helped me. It helped me focus on the narrative story, ra- um, and how to communicate that story to other people who may not ever experience something like this or experience an aligned um type of story, um. And that challenge um, made it to a, a place where I kind of felt done, where I was like, oh, I'm looking back now. <laughs> um, this is done. And I get this great privilege to move forward now. That's a great way of putting it. I was curious. I was wondering if the book was, writing the book was part of the looking back process. And I know mm-hmm. a few minutes ago, you also talked about what it was like for you to sort of you know, be introduced to the words dead reckoning and how you mm-hmm. unfolded and, and unpacked uh, that description for us. I really, it, there's it, there's so much meaning even in the title of your book. Uh, it's just, mm-hmm. it's so fascinating. I can't wait to start reading it. It's going to be on my, it's on my summer uh, book list for reading. So. Oh, thank you. Thank <laughs> you for reading in advance. I love my readers. They're so generous <laughs> with their time. And uh, I will say I it will break your heart, but I promise to put it back together again. <laughs> I'm looking forward to every part. I have a lot of gratitude for you to 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 do this for you and to do this for people and and to to write this book to take the time and space to recoil, go in, figure it out, your inner journey, mm-hmm. find a way to articulate it, make peace with it, make all the connections, whether or not you're the only one doing it, and bringing it mm-hmm. to the world knowing mm-hmm. that there are other people who suffer and who have witnessed crime and that crime has had heavy impacts in their world and that you're now bringing this or you've already brought it to the world. There are readers who are going to be able to resonate with it. Well, if they thank haven't you. Already. And, and, and so I'm well, excited I, to be able I to really read appreciate it. That. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm so excited to read it. And in fact, I feel a little guilty that I haven't read it yet. <laughs> so don't so you I'm, dare feel guilty. You're, I'm we're, even... <laughs> we're all busy gals. Um, I, right. I I will say though that you know at the end of me like so uh, when I returned from meeting this man and then when I finished writing to him and I was kind of telling more people at that time that I had done this kind of it was it was done now, and um, people asked me you know like oh how did it go like what was it about did it and um and I really struggled to tell them like within a couple of minutes you know that the, the occasion allowed and so eventually I got to the, the form of a book and um I uh while I was writing of course the main creative um challenge is to to write the narrative in a in a way to, to for it to resonate for someone else and so um but all along I was kind of like I was so I've always been very annoyed with how um, uh, survivors of crime are positioned in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, survivors of trauma mm-hmm. as very much like victims. It's very mm-hmm. like circular, like <laughs> like it just reaffirms itself through its own narrative, like in the media, in all sorts of places, in lots of psychological theory, all this kind of stuff. And and um and so for me, it was kind of an act of like I'm going to offer this other story. Um, to I think it is a growing field within like people regaining voice and and sharing voice about their experiences of the world and so it was such a privilege to now sit on the true crime shelf uh, and yet be a victim story so because you know you know I joined a, a a like a crime, um, a literary crime association mm-hmm. uh, uh, while I was doing some professional writing. And, um, and I learned like, I just, that most, most crime dramas uh, or crime books are about either the, the murderer um, or um, written from the police perspective. And I was like, where are the people who have been harmed? Like, where are they in these mm-hmm. stories? Mm-hmm. And how dare we all then have created this? And then We've all created this, I mean, in kind of pop culture society uh, in writ large. And then, of, co- of course, we think these ways about victims, right? And so I was like, this was my little point of resistance to be like, no, <laughs> here's some mental beauty for you. Here's a process of pursuing life in a different way. Right. So even along with the resistance and the beauty, your journey as uh, stifling as it had been at the start Mm -hmm. and with all the different elements and aspects that came up along the way, um, I'm hearing a lot of positive influence about this journey and that you've been able to describe it. You've it's how you've been sharing is in indescribable and Mm -hmm. 
like like the experience that you had is is you've been describing it, but it seems to be the way you're telling it is 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 like you're tapping into those indescribable ways. If that makes any sense, yes, right? It does, and and ultimately, like the um, and that was the challenge was how do you describe the indescribable, right? Yeah. Like how do you describe that eleven year old girl in a bathroom shaking, right? How do you describe the moment of meeting your father's murderer? How do you describe the feeling of freedom immediately after? You know, and and so I did. I did through the moment. I did it through the senses. I did mm-hmm. it through the specific location, the specific moment of looking back and doing that. And you know, that actually, for my understanding and knowledge of um of uh, you know counseling therapy etc is that that's incredibly helpful for a young, uh, for a survivor of crime to do is to remember like and feel empowered by that and be able to set that aside and move forward as opposed to have those as triggering moments right or right. or um, moments that have control over you instead you get to fully describe them and um and and move be able to have freedom for yourself to move forward right so much freedom and processing the way that you took it on. You know, Karis, I'm I have a bit more curiosity about how your mental health was affected with regards mm-hmm. to this untold story. So, you know, you you did mention that um mm-hmm. you were a highly you were an individual who was very much operating in a highly functional way, succeeding at life. Performance was key for you, it seems. And I think you also mentioned something about, maybe maybe I got the term wrong, but something about mm-hmm. existential depression. So I'm curious yeah. about these aspects uh, affecting your mental health. Are you able to share mm-hmm. a little bit about that? Absolutely. So I would say um, I kind of use that extra describer of, of like existential depression. Um, because um, I was really dissatisfied with some of the mental health language that um, people use, different professionals used, or just, you know, society in general. Um, I, I see it as both a strength and a barrier of being like kind of this overperformer. I, you know, I like, I love school. I still love school. And I'm so glad that I immersed myself in just school (laughs) Um, uh, and learning and exploration as both a distraction and as as a place to feel normal and as a place to go to, you know, to seek out mentors and teachers, all these things, but then also um, as a safe place to hold you while you are in struggle. So I would say, you know, I, I think of looking back, I think, you know, there was just this deep, like, hole of sadness and um, that entered my life uh, when my dad died. And so I've definitely been diagnosed with um, anxiety, depression. Mm-hmm. Uh, one, one psychiatrist, after five minutes of meeting me and, uh, you know, asking about this particular life history, uh, d- said I had post-traumatic stress disorder. And when I was like, oh, what's that? I'm going to go look at what that means. Um, I looked at the the symptoms and I didn't meet any of them. Right. Um, I definitely met, um, uh, the, the requirements of, uh, the, of depression, um, Mm -hmm. but, um, but not post-traumatic stress disorder. So I had a, I I had this like window into some professionals, um, kind of like over diagnosis or, you know, a little trigger happy when they, when they, they kind of see the history of murder. And so, you know, I have a real, um, critique of our mental health system and yet I see it totally changing and on a totally different trajectory right now which is so exciting um and your but, story but specifically like, had a lot of subtleties right like not not just the mm-hmm. story but your experience and and mm-hmm. what you witnessed and what you didn't witness and how you process as an 11 year old and how you mm-hmm. operated and functioned as an 11 year old and then in the years mm-hmm. um after that so my guess is there was a lot of subtleties in what you were experiencing and in the mental health profession, it is very easy to go to that diagnosis place, right? Firsthand. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And you know what really, what, what I really loved about people who were in those positions. So the guidance counselor or the school social worker mm-hmm. um, or uh, various mentors, teachers, and um, people who had quite a bit of influence and in, over your life during that time. And, and the ones who I gravitated towards and the ones I still remember, the ones I still have as Facebook friends mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, are the people who just made space for you. Uh, the people who just who just said, oh, that's where you're at. OK, come be in my space with me, too. Mm. And um, who thought of you as this like super cool young person doing their thing and um, uh, figuring it out, having hard days and good days and just making 
room for you, right? Um, and not the ones who just, you know, told you what you're feeling or, you know, tried to, you know, fix something. It's like, how can you fix murder? Like, no, stop. Like, right. let's let people be people and experience what they're experiencing. Um, and the people who I feel honor you, you in that moment, no matter what age you are going through, those are the good people <laughs> in the system. Yeah, there's a real resonance mm-hmm. when there's the helping person comes from that mm-hmm. that place of openness and curiosity. It's so much more in- invitational um, yeah. than the person who's kind of saying, but do you feel this? But what about yeah. that? And I think it could be yeah. this. And you're young, so you yeah. might not have the language, but let me tell you about this. 100%. And I, um, it's one of the reasons why I went into the child and youth care profession right. um, and field of scholarship. And because it's all about centering the young person, mm-hmm. centering their perspective of the world, mm-hmm. centering the fact that they are um, human, that they're fully developed, that they are have something to contribute who um who you're just so glad that they're there and, and that you get this privilege of walking through the world with them and so um so entirely drawn um not not by chance to um, this part of the social care helping field um mm-hmm. because I was just like oh gosh like what are we doing to young people in ways that we think are good but they're actually mm-hmm. quite harmful so Karis what is your key message to the listeners of our show listening to the lovely, gentle, inviting, safe, kind voice that you have talking to you all the time that doesn't sound like a harassing voice or a pressured voice or a should voice or all those voices that we have in telling us how what we should do or how we should navigate in a good way. I like I've always um for better like to greater degrees of success and not um had this kind of like lovely gentle quiet voice saying Karis you should write right now like write Mm. (laughs) just write Mm -hmm. that'll make you feel better right um or or even just the the voice that recognized what my friend asked me that day when I was close to 30 and she said do you know anything about him and I thought oh like that's it that's what I need to be focusing on right now um and so um, for me, I access this voice through writing. There's no question about it. I, I access it through writing. Sometimes I access it through meditation now. I'm older as I've grown and developed different strategies or coping, whatever you want to call it. But for me, it was writing. And I know for everyone else, like it might be a totally different thing. And so whatever way that you can access that voice that takes care of you, that always respects you, no questions. Like there's no, you know, that always knows what you need. And when you do listen to it and follow it, you are better. You feel just a little better. And because I think there's so many things out in the world right now telling us what to do, what to be, what we should do, all these things. And with good intention, all, many of those things exist with great intention. But any way you may access it through dialogue, through counseling, through writing, through um, movement, through all these different ways, through accessing nature, um, through engaging with young people, whatever it is, just mm-hmm. listen to that, listen mm-hmm. to it and honor it. And you will then, and you will be taking care of yourself. Phenomenal. What a wonderful message. Mm-hmm. Another um curiosity of mine is what is that game changer inspiration that really you might hold close to you something that sparks for you that reflects your untold story so would there be a quote or a book an event a person something that really drove home for you yes and I was thinking about this I actually it comes from my book and um quite early on in the book I write a quote and it came before I say it I'll just say where it came from so I was at my family's house a number of years ago before I started this journey this part of the journey and uh, it was in my step family as well we were all there and uh, I think we were planning someone's funeral it might have it was one of my grandparents I don't remember let's see we were talking about something about the planning of it a couple of us were writing speeches etc and out of the blue my stepbrother said this sentence that I will never forget and I included it in my book because I wanted to put it on um, paper Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he said death invites people to live the meaning that I I take from that is that that death is about the living it's about the people who survive the death and what we do with that moment and 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 that death invites people to live it's it's like a when something closes, when something ends, when something is destroyed, like my father, 
how do I as the living go on living? Um, and, uh, and how do I want that life to look? And, uh, and how, um, how do I pursue living instead of surviving? Um, and so for me, that's what it means. And um, it really instructs my life in the sense of um, it gives me agency. It gives me, it gives me a feeling of growth and generativity as opposed to destruction, which we often associate with death. Wow, that is so powerful. And if it's okay, I would like to continue to share this quote with other people as well. I think that these few words are so powerful and it can really drive a lot of meaning. And thank you for taking the time to, to share. You're just getting me more and more eager to write your, to read your book. <laughs> I'm getting so much. <laughs> I, you're, I'm so eager to read your book now. I'm just getting more and more eager. Thank My you. dear, what's a cause or organization that has been impactful to you on your journey that you'd like to give a shout out to? So I would love to give a shout out to the Community Justice Initiative. The, it's in the Fraser Valley, located in Langley, British Columbia. Uh, but they have impacts across Canada and they've been total leaders of um, restorative justice over the past 25 years. Um, they acknowledge that restorative justice is heavily based in Indigenous uh, knowledges um, and uh, and the reparation and reconstruction um, of relationships after uh, repair after harm. And so some of the things they're doing are amazing, including training lots of victim services and, and criminal justice practitioners across Canada. They offer services. Um, they're underfunded, and so uh, we need to fund them more. Sure. And um, they're lovely and amazing. And the, the people who work for community justice initiatives are um, are the most amazing humans you'll ever come across. They allow space for you to pursue that journey, and they don't influence it. They just make space for it and walk alongside you. Uh, that's that's great. Yeah, shout out to community justice initiatives for sure. Clearly, they were a strong presence in your life, and um. And if we keep it going, strong presence for others as well. So, Karis, how can yeah. people connect with you if they would like to? Well, first oh, of all, gosh. are okay. you open to that? <laughs> Firstly, are you open to, to people connecting with you? And and how can they connect with you? Sure. I mean, um, I find myself much more boring than my book. And so I would say, like, I'm just like a regular person living in the life in the world. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> I find it. So, so I would say, um, like I mean, if you're if you're curious about anything that I've discussed or ranted about today, or you know all the things, is that you know in the in the book I really take readers through these like these themes and journeys and story, and so I would say go there and then go do something that inspires you to do something similar, right? Mm -hmm. And that I that me as a human being, I'm not the necessary person in in your life, or that you that you are that you are the most amazing person in your life, and um, uh, but you know I'm I, I'm easily found. <laughs> I okay. you know I teach at Douglas College. I um, I have a website of my other writing and um projects. I uh, so kariscraig.com will take you to my kind of portfolio site uh, to find out some of the things that I'm I'm doing and have uh, other things that I've written. Um and uh, and yeah and then and you know you can message me through there. Yeah. Wonderful. Karis, congratulations. You've just dared yourself to share. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you for the invitation to do so. Karis, let me tell you, you have shown up today like a joyful ball of lovely fire. I am so thankful for your exquisite expression opening up with so much vulnerability. Let me just say that this was truly a thought-provoking conversation and you really have braved today, dared today, and hopefully allowing listeners to tap into their own individual stories and connect with whatever lays raw inside of them. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you for your questions and thank you for listening. Once again, Karis, thank you for being a part of Dare to Share Your Untold Story and helping to be a voice in breaking down the barriers of mental stigma. To all of our listeners, if you like what you've been hearing on this podcast and you want to be part of breaking down barriers of mental stigma, I invite you to go wherever you are listening to the episode and hit subscribe. Leave us a comment or a review of the episode and maybe how you relate to it. To learn more about what we offer, visit 
www.daretoheal.co. And if you are feeling ready and brave to share, please submit your story by visiting www.daretoshare.co. Thanks for joining in.